Good afternoon. I'm going to introduce the Teaching Conversations panel. I initiated Teaching Conversations in Fall 2011 as a way to bring feminist educators together from different disciplines to engage in conversations about the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection, specifically about ways to use it in our teaching. The conversations have been recorded and transcribed for inclusion in the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection, an archive that lives physically here at Penn State Libraries and online in the Living section of the collection site. Documentation of student work created as part of diverse curricular engagement with the Judy Chicago Archives at Penn State is another example of how the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection is a living archive and living curriculum. This panel presents four generative teaching projects with the collection. I will begin with a few examples of how the Judy Chicago collection has been integral to my teaching. Feminist pedagogy situates issues of power and balance as a central theme. Like other feminist educators, Judy Chicago stresses that transforming dominant power relations is a central goal of feminist pedagogy. Power is implicated in teacher-student relationships, in access to opportunities, in self-realization, among other implications. Chicago's pedagogy begins by replacing the traditional teacher-student relationship with a less hierarchical structure in which the teacher becomes facilitator rather than authority figure. Chicago's authority derives from what she has achieved as an artist rather than from a rigid role relationship. Feminist pedagogues affect social change, see teaching as a political act, view knowledge as value-laden, seek equality for all, value personal experience, value all voices, value multiple perspectives, value self-representation, is student-centered, and foster distributed and shared leadership. Insights from my in-depth study of the Judy Chicago's teaching methodology is published in studies in art education in 2007. The collection also includes an online component, notably the Dinner Party Curriculum Project developed by Marilyn Stewart, Peg Spears, and Carrie Norlin under the directorship of Stewart and in collaboration with Chicago and Constance Bumgarten G. given by, by Through the Flower to, to Penn State's College of Arts and architecture for stewardship by the art education program. There are 14 honors with the dinner party raising questions such as whose history is privileged. One of the dinner party curriculum project encounters, Encounter 3, helps students understand the societal need for feminism. In my teaching, I begin with experiential approaches and discussion on what students know about patriarchy and where from what sources they have learned about patriarchal culture. What they come to realize is that patriarchy surrounds, like the air we breathe, is unmarked, unlike feminism, which is marked with misinformation, stereotypes, straw tropes, and fears in the surrounding patriarchy, media, and visual culture. Bell Hooks states that feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression. To explore concepts of feminism and patriarchy, I often employ Augusta Boal's theater strategies for non-theater people, such as the mirror sequence or image theater in which students sculpt feminism or patriarchy in the bodies of others, while others witness and photograph for discussion in the class. During spring 2014, I teamed up with artist-in-residence Nancy Yodelman, to teach a special topics course incorporating Judy Chicago's feminist art teaching methodology documented in the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection. Yodelman was a student of Judy Chicago's in the feminist art program in the 1970s. Course participants experimented with the participatory art pedagogy to engage interactive, content-based, visual and performative feminist art activism for an exhibition titled Out of Here aimed at a wide audience that frequents a university commons area, the Hub-Robinson area, um, in particularly the Art Alley. 
Self-reflexivity, collective memory work, feminist consciousness awakenings, and searches were the catalyst for collaboration and creativity. The participants in this particular course were from Saudi Arabia, Iran, Korea, and the United States. And those from the U.S. identified as Cuban, Arab, Cherokee, Italian, and other identities. The participants explored their ascribed, selected, and enforced positionalities. We held performances every Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m. from March 20th to April 17th um, this, past, th this spring 2014 at the Hub Robinson Art Alley Gallery in conjunction with the Out of Here exhibition that was created in the Jude Chicago at Penn State course. Um, we, we had, um, as I mentioned in the previous presentation about our pedagogy, we went through the, the work through the three stages of Jude Chicago's pedagogy, including the preparation of shared readings and self-presentations and research. We use the circle pedagogy from this class discussed earlier feminist art today. Pedagogy. The participatory pedagogy, the participatory art, and the participatory performance. One of the things that strikes me is the importance of, you got it, participation to effective learning, which of course we see its importance demonstrated again and again in schools, but the theory doesn't always go into action. Whereas with Chicago's pedagogy, that participation is possible for everyone, because when you're in that circle of sharing and listening, everyone needs to speak as you go around the circle, even if individually you're, you know, you're scared to speak up in front of the class, or you think that you don't have anything important to say, or you think that you sound foolish but you still speak up, whereas in a traditional classroom, we probably wouldn't have raised your hand, you probably would never have contributed and participated. And again, that circle is useful for those people who like to say a lot and generally dominate the classroom, because when you're going around that circle and you need to give everyone time to speak, they have to pare down their words to only what's the most relevant and the most crucial aspects of the conversation, rather than babbling on and you know going on tangents. And then we can translate that same circle, that sharing and listening, into art. And again, that reinforces the participation aspect because this time as you're you know, making art, you're taking action, you have physical participation in this creation. This translation uh, from listening and participating as a class into physically participating by making art was really important for me because I've never considered myself an artist but I would definitely you know have always considered myself an activist and you know community oriented active person so the participatory art pedagogy made art into action for me which is something that I could identify more with both as a member of this class group actively working together and as a member of other larger communities then when I turned to the performance aspect, participation was again key, not only in that we were allowing the viewers to participate in the, in the meetings and in the performances and hopefully to learn something, but also that we, uh, in the class, were participating in each other's ideas. Because up until a day or two before, you didn't know what you'd be performing Thursday afternoon, you just showed up. <laughs> so you needed a willingness to jump in to the concepts that your classmates brought forth and that they wanted to explore and then from what they said you drew on your own past experiences and then you in turn introduced it to other people the, like the viewers who weren't in the class to, you'd introduce them to the concept and then even though this is a performance and about giving a show it's also about learning so you yourself are learning about the concepts that your classmates brought forth and sometimes the best way to learn is to participate to the fullest extent, which is you know to teach other people, teaching the audience, the viewers. So I guess um, reflecting in some of the participatory performance, participatory art, and participatory pedagogy, for me the most important thing was learning through participating, about learning about each other, our histories, our goals, um, learning about how to change the world and why we should change the world. And then after we you know, kind of figured it out and had some ideas flowing, sharing that w in the performances with our viewers, and hopefully, you know, they can learn something too and pass it on. And uh, we did the self-presentations. Um, Hanji Kwan is presenting here about um, her emerging ideas about comfort women. 
we developed and it, it, moving into stage two, discussing the the mode and media format decisions, how to take the ideal to real, and building support for each other. The art making um, also became a, a place of balancing support and um, helping each other. In fact, um, you know whether it was bringing in materials such as this curtain or the the paints or how to do the lettering, building ideas. It also involved content-based critiques and and eventually exhibition and evaluation through audience response and our own response to the artwork. Judy Chicago refers to her pedagogy as participatory art pedagogy informed by feminist principles. This course applied her participatory art pedagogy. By participatory art pedagogy, what I mean is that we emphasized the pulling to pulling people in to create something together, able to add themselves into the work. Uh, there is aspects in which you create something that opens up a form or content that people add to it. Participatory performance is different from spectator performance. You can take the role of observer, and that is one way to participate, um, but we weren't on a stage. We, we placed ourselves into a public space. Participatory art pedagogy refers to the participation of many people in dialogue about visual culture in which their dialogue is the artistic and material from which collaborative artworks are created. Example of one of the um, performances in which we greeted each other and talked about the work and, and then moved out to those sitting around in the art alley at the hub to pull them in to the process of engagement with the artwork. I also taught a course this spring, Feminist Gallery Conversations, which was comprised of a series of gallery talks throughout the spring that have been audio recorded and are available on the Judy Chicago Collection website that, um, as podcasts. These, are, these talks are by Penn State faculty members and they include Feminisms in the Gallery by Dana Carlisle Kletchka, Curator of Education at the Palmer Museum of Art. Futures of Feminist Past this talk is by me. Mirror, Mirror on the Wall, Who's the Finest of Them All? D, Evaluation of Black Female Beauty by Wanda Knight, Associate Professor of Art Education and Women's Studies. Paper Tigress, Graphic Images of Female Power by Charlotte Houghton. She's Associate Professor of Art History. The Vagina Dialogues by Susan Russell, Associate Professor of Theater. Judy Chicago and the Promise of Utopia by Jennifer Wagner Lawler, Associate Professor of English and Women's Studies. And The Conversation Around the Table, Feminist Art and the Transnational by Habiba Bedaroom, Assistant Professor of Women's Studies in African and African American Studies. And finally, Judy Chicago Views by me. In the next four presentations in this panel, my colleagues will share ways that they have used the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection in their courses. Hello, my name is Linda Short. I will describe how I used art and the Judy Chicago Collection in my History and Jewish Studies course titled, The History of the Holocaust. Using art may seem surprising. However, there are natural links between art and this period of history, whether it is that Hitler thought himself an artist, his denouncing of modern art in Mein Kampf, charging Jews with influencing and creating degenerative art, or the massive theft of art from private and national collections. About this latter point, has anyone seen the current George Clooney movie, The Monuments Men? You know, the Holocaust has been described using words such as incomprehensible, inconceivable, unimaginable. And yet we look at and teach facts, figures, and statistics and ask students to make a connection to and understand this history. Connection and understanding are better made through personal stories and concrete experience. Indeed, best pedagogical practice is to begin not from theory, but rather from student experience. 
and so we complement the study of history with film, memoirs, and meeting survivors. Making these personal connections is essential, as a student wrote, having learned about the Holocaust since I was a kid, I thought I had an understanding of what it was and what the Jewish experience was until I read the memoir I chose. I realize now I didn't know much of anything. I didn't get it, how people's lives were affected daily, tragically, in so many real and ordinary ways. And so now, let's examine how art and artistic representation are appropriate complements that both permit students to make personal connections and permit educators to teach history. I used art to supplement course content in three ways. First, introducing students to Judy Chicago's retrospective exhibit. Second, asking students to research Jewish artists, their stories, and their art. Third, using images from a work as a springboard from which to teach a related segment of history. First, focusing specifically on Judy Chicago's work. Students watched Judy Chicago and Donald Woodman's video about the making of Holocaust Project, their 16-piece installation. In it, the artists described their personal journey, motivations, and concerns. We visited Chicago's exhibit at the Campus Palmer Museum of Art, itself a new experience for 90% of the students. The exhibit includes the 16-foot cartoon, The Fall, from the Holocaust Project installation. Although the piece in our exhibit is the cartoon or model, if you will, the finished work is a tapestry. The artist used the medium of weaving, intentionally, to express the idea that the Holocaust grew out of the very fabric of Western civilization, that anti-Jewish sentiment was woven into and was an integral part of a long historical context, thus making connections between anti-Semitism and the later Holocaust. This tapestry and artist's vision both dovetailed with early course content. The first few weeks of each semester, I construct a framework from which to examine the Shoah. For as I say to students, the Holocaust didn't just fall from the sky. It emerged from an environment, from the intersection of theories and movements and scientific discoveries and long-handled beliefs. During our museum visit, students examined and discussed Chicago's work the symbols used, and the markers of identity, and contrasted them with a broader examination of influences that we consider in our coursework. Second, a research assignment asked students to discover Jewish artists, their personal stories, and their art. Using specialized databases and more than a dozen books that profiled artists or addressed issues of artistic representation, Students engaged the diversity of Jewish experience and response, as well as the continuing presence and influence of this history in the artists' lives. Whether or not the artists came from Europe, lived during that time, or experienced it firsthand. As for the art itself, some was created during the Holocaust and later. Some art, such as these examples, appeared to be factually representative. Some pieces students discovered were symbolic or abstract. Others standing alone showed no discernible link to this time period. Yet all offer a window into history and the disparate ways in which that history was experienced. A third specific way in which I incorporated works both by Chicago and others was by choosing an image and using it as a platform from which to introduce specific course content. For example, showing this Judy Chicago piece, referencing the train and child, and then teaching about kinder transports. Moving from that discussion to another artist, Frank Meisler, who himself was a child saved by the kinder transports. As an adult, 50 years later, 
he would produce a series of public bronzes that now sit in the four cities through which he traveled as a child on the train. Gdansk, Berlin, Berlin, Rotterdam, and London. What then are some of the issues when using art in a classroom? As educators, we acknowledge that an artist has a different role and vision from that of an historian. However, students appear to understand the differences and accept that these different approaches complement each other to create a more complete picture of history, pun intended. This is how one of my students responded in an essay examining the piece The Fall from our museum visit. Chicago painted a beautiful mural, but I believe this piece may be limiting in the teaching of the Holocaust. Her passion for feminism overpowers the mural and becomes the main focal point, in my opinion. A wholly different interpretation of the same piece of art was detailed in another student's writing. She wrote, Judy Chicago's The Fall shows a body similar to da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, also known as the perfect man. This may represent how Hitler envisioned a perfect society of Aryans. We also see Nazis were killing machines and painting an assembly line which started with animals but down the line showed humans. This shows that Jews were treated like animals and an assembly line to murder them was most efficient. About the role of artists specifically, one student noted, artists and others tell stories in their own ways. Visual images can reach a wide audience and have the ability to transcend language barriers as well as help students who are visual learners. Another student offered, Judy Chicago's pieces teach about both the violent events of the Holocaust and the heartbreaking emotions that resulted from them. An artist may undertake a visual representation in order to convey aspects of the Holocaust that history books do not transmit. And finally, occasionally art may stand alone, but it is best if documentation and evidence are provided as well. This is because art may be interpreted in different ways. The knowledgeable viewer will be able to understand the images depicted and make connections to what they previously learned. As educators, and as these students did, we acknowledge that artistic representation offers both benefits and limitations. Nevertheless, art may be a noteworthy complementary point of entry through which students may access places of understanding from which to reflect both on historic choices and on the choices they make in their own life experience today. Okay, um, my name is Jennifer Wagner Lawler and I'm a faculty member here at Penn State in Women's Studies and in Literature, English Literature. and. Um, my um, particular involvement at the moment, because as Karen uh, said, she and I have been working on all manner of different things together, but one of the, the things that I was um, tasked with uh, at the end of last year was to, um, to think about a redesign for an online introduction to women's studies course uh, that's under now an updated title, Representing Women and Gender in Literature, the Arts, and Popular Culture. Um, the, the course that exists now ha was, was designed quite a long time ago and it just needs uh, a lot of updating and um, general reformatting. And uh, as I was sort of uh, assigned this task, um, at the same time it was when Karen was uh, bring, had brought the collection here, was beginning to have these <coughs> teaching conversations and so I began to um, you know, logically um, think about how this collection, how uh, Judy Chicago's pedagogy, how my own notion of what feminism 
is um, and feminist pedagogy might be um, all began to sort of intermingle. So um, I didn't really have any, any um, preconceived notion of what I wanted this course to look like, but I, I did have in mind already um, the words of Bell Hooks, um, who has been cited before, um, from her beautiful um, little manifesta, um, Feminism is for Everybody. And at the close of the introduction, um, Hooks urges us to, and these are the last words of the intro, quote, come closer, see how feminism can touch and change your life and all our lives. Come closer and know firsthand what feminist movement is all about. Come closer and you will see feminism is for everybody. Well, to me, that seemed like kind of a perfect way of opening a class as an opening reading. It, because it sort of is a kind of beckoning or invitation, or um, as often is the case with our students, a coaxing to come in and think about feminism. Um, and then it hit me, um, this idea of a, of a coaxing or um, an inviting might work really well by connecting it up with Judy Chicago's dinner party project. And of course the curricula that are being already developed around it. So I thought, you know, wouldn't Chicago's famous piece be a great way to open a course um, that wants to introduce to students um, who, um, who actually might be on campus, because it is online, but who very well may not be on campus. Um, Penn State has a um, kind of umbrella online uh, education unit called the World Campus, and it's going to run through that. Um, World Campus students can be anywhere. The university boasts that it has World Campus students on every continent, including Antarctica, at least in that um, one semester. And so how to kind of think about an audience that way and create some kind of online course that could actually um, you know, embrace all of these people. So. Uh, you know, I, it needs to do that. It needs to teach something about the history of women's social movements. It needs to teach something about the history and principles of feminism, um, feminist art, and its relationship to traditional and mainstream uh, fine arts, um, to history, as we just heard in the last presentation. Um, and so, optimistically, you know, I, I want to try to touch on every student's, you know, inner feminist. <laughs> um, uh, assuming that they have one, and I do, um, no matter how they might um, identify in terms of gender or sexuality. Um, one thing I, I just thought about is um, the uh, you know, previous, um, during the previous uh, talks, is that it's been very difficult for me to think about redesigning this online course. I've, I actually kind of stalled um, <laughs> in the middle of this semester. And in part, I hadn't quite thought about it in these terms, but in part it's because of the way the, uh, the world campus demands that we design these courses, which is a very unfeminist way. Right? It's very hierarchical. And the way I'm supposed to design it, any of you who are teachers will, I hope, commiserate with me, that you're put on a schedule and it says, okay, week one, we, by this date we need to have these four in the can. And then we're going to have these four in the can. And I don't want to have to go back, says the web designer, I don't want to have to go back, you know, we, it has to be really co absolutely complete. This is so um, inimical to the way uh, I, my brain works and I think most people's brains work because as teachers we're always adjusting what we do, you know, in part depending on the students themselves. So, um, so actually, having stalled out about three weeks ago and gone to my department head and said, I'm, fail you know, I, I'm, I'm here to admit failure, I have to like, think of something else, kind of be talking again um, about Judy Chicago and about her work made me really think uh, again about how can the dinner party provide a kind of structure for the course that would in fact allow the course to be more flexible than the kind of you know, week by week in a can model would um, suggest. Also, um, the fact that we have these archives um, allows, too, for the, that kind of flexibility to happen because um, these students will be online, right? They will not be in front of 
me or anybody else in a classroom. And so to be able to send them to all of the resources that are online um, with the uh, collection here serving as a kind of portal. Um, if you've looked, of course, you'll see the links to the Brooklyn Museum. You'll see um, various other links. And so the archive, the online archive itself can become one of the great resources uh, of the course. Um, at the same time, um, the uh, Duty Chicago archives have suggested to me and could also suggest to any of the online instructors who, who take it over ways that they might um, be able to uh, you know, open up their online uh, learning environment to individual stories, to individual histories, and um, to incorporate that into the class. If this were a year from now, I would be much more specific, um, like Linda Short's presentation was, um, about what I, I'm going to do, but um, I don't exactly know yet, um, so I'll, I'll let you all know a year from now. But, um, but I do know that I'm, I'm interested in this feminist principle of hospitality and inclusiveness, and that the dinner party um, can uh, offer that out as a kind of structure for the course. Um, one of the obvious assignments I, um, that was mentioned before is, I think Brenna, you talked about doing this, was um, yeah, making students think about who's not at the table, you know, who's, who doesn't have a place at the table. Um, I've already incorporated that language into my um, residential version of the course this semester. Crashing the party, you know, the, the verbal play is, is a lot of fun. Um, and to think about who, who they would want to invite to the party, make, have them research that person, um, whether that person is in their own life or whether it's a historical figure, and you know, make their own place cards and their own um, banners and, and runners, actually. I mean, you can imagine all kinds of um, kind of art-based projects that could come out of that and that could actually be done online as well. Um, and of course, there is the, the work itself, the dinner party, and to maybe what I'm thinking is spending um, the opening weeks of the course not just setting it up in terms of this invitation into feminism, but also studying the dinner party itself. Because of course, in that work, you one can talk about um, the theoretical challenge of producing feminist art. You can talk about it as historical document, um, as an exercise in, act in feminist activism you know, in itself. And as the class moves forward, then you can um, talk about other individual artists, um, different media, different political positions, and whoever the instructor is, they can always keep fixed on this goal of a commitment to dialogue, inclusiveness, um, and openness that actually um, Judy's uh, feminist pedagogy, pedagogical principles um, uh, embody. Um, I have to say that uh, because of this semester I do have a, a residential class, it was really a treat last week to take my students to uh, both to the Palmer um, to see uh, Judy's work and also to Borland to see Nancy's work. And something I didn't really expect there, something that um, <laughs> I don't know how exactly you could replicate um, uh, online, but I'll figure out a way, was that they, in seeing, you know, up, you know, face to face, two different artists' work, what they immediately noticed was this interesting contrast between the kind of monumentalism of Judy's work and the kind of intimacy of Nancy's work. And you can see, um, you know, and, and I thought that was a really kind of instructive contrast, and I, that I, one that I plan to, to keep, um, because you know, we do tend to hear about feminist art as um, as you know, the, about, the, about the everyday, about the intimate. Um, and interestingly, my students were, they didn't, they liked your work better. And I think it was because that, that kind of like, in your, you know, monumentalism, you know, I think it scared them. You know, I think it was that kind of activist, feminist thing that maybe made some of them uncomfortable. I'm not sure, I haven't asked them this, but, um, but that to me seemed like a really great uh, contrast because it, in either case you're talking about history, you're talking about big, you know, broad sense of history, you're talking about personal family histories. And so 
um, I think, you know, in retrospect, I would like to, for them to see the intimacy in Judy's work and the, <laughs> the monumentalism or the history uh, of your work. They noticed, though, that, you know, when you were telling them stories about the, the, um, the letter writers and, you know, in your work, too, they were, they, they heard that and they were really fascinated by that as a process and how that transferred itself into art. So, um, so the final thing I want to say is that um, I, I also think that one of the interesting things about having an online learning environment and the online archives as kind of integrated into the course is that the students themselves should know that they will become part of the living archive. So uh, as they produce narratives of their own, um, you know, meditations of their own, perhaps little art pieces of their own online, um, I'm going to, you know, they will be informed right off the bat that that can be um, loaded onto the, the archive server here and that it becomes part of the experiment, becomes part of the dialogue. And so uh, a way, I think, of not just inviting them to sit at the table and just sort of listen, but sit in the, at the table and participate and, you know, enjoy the party, crash the party, however they want to act in the party, but um, that they, they're part of that history in a way that they probably never considered themselves to. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Um, my name is Wanda Knight, and I guess, I don't, am I touching the computer or that thing here? I'll find out. We'll find out together. Um, and I'm Associate Professor of Art Education and Women's Studies here at Penn State. And a particular signature course that I teach uh, relates to uh, diversity, visual culture, and pedagogy. And it is a general education course in which there are very diverse people who, who take this course and seem to be attracted to it. So I'm constantly seeking ways to make per have them make personal connections to the art, um, to each other, and uh, also looking at how we are similar to or different than each other. And difference is not a bad thing, because sometimes we're always looking for our similarities. But difference is also um, uh, quite good. Many come into this particular course recognizing that groups of people and societies have been devalued and dehumanized. A common noted example, of course, many people note that the Nazi in Nazi Germany, when Adolf Hitler deliberately and systemically exterminated millions of European Jews and other alleged Undimension, um, Undimension is a term in na Nazi racial ideology used to describe inferior people. And they were categorized as homosexuals, blacks, poles, disabled people, gypsies, other people, specifically those not um, of the Aryan um, descent. So during this presentation, I focus on the devaluation of black females in U.S. and global societies. Through teaching conversations, I use Judy Chicago's collection, specifically two works at the Palmer Museum of Art, if you have not had that opportunity to get there yet, but I know we'll have a reception there. Um, and I want to look at it into how we can delve into feminist thought. And I'm going to highlight those two examples that I use in the teaching conversations, which will be online or are online as well. So I go back to this, which you're going to see probably quite a bit. And looking at Judy Chicago's, again, this cartoon from the fall, this is from a Holocaust project. And um, I'm going to share the three um, sections and details in the next um, couple of slides. So again, um, according to Judy Chicago, the Holocaust Project is, quote, structured as a journey into the darkness of the Holocaust and out into the light of hope. So I hope that that's what I'm bringing. So I'll talk about this dark side of some of these issues, literally and figuratively speaking, and then looking at hof hopefully a lighter side of hope. I've used these pieces in teaching, again, to look at how the black woman is dehumanized. So if you look at the first, first section in detail, arguably, and see this one doesn't allow me to do that, when you look at the first section, um, and I usually bring the laser, but I didn't this time. Uh, when you see these women, if you look at the first image to the far left, 
Uh, you see like a crown figure, it could be tree, the roots. Um, this individual is perhaps a queen. And I think about black women, they are queens. Think about um, Africa, um, and people want to say Egyptians or whomever, but Egypt is in Africa. Their African people were kings and queens, um, particularly talking about the black woman. She was queen. She was goddess in Africa. Um, so she was kidnapped. And you look at these dark figures coming. They're being abducted. They're being taken to these distant lands. Records indicate that 12 million Africans were shipped across the Atlantic. African and African-American scholars sometimes refer to this as the transatlantic slave trade called the African Holocaust, the Ma'afa, meaning great disaster. And this is in Kiswahili. Estimates suggest that 1 to 2.5 million Africans died during the Middle Passages. Others died, of course, soon after their arrival. The black woman, the women that su survived the Ma'afa were sold on auction blocks, separated from their children and their families, forced to work in the fields and homes of the slave owners. They were raped. They were beaten, labeled as Aunt Jemima. They were labeled as bitch, Jezebel. They were also labeled as angry, uh, bossy women. She's considered less attractive than her Caucasian, Asian, Latin counterparts. Oftentimes, she's devalued by not only white men, but black men as well. With that said, I found an interesting statistic that showed that 41% of African American women have never been married. That is very interesting compared to approximately 20% or less in other groups of people because black women are not perceived to be very beautiful people. So when I look at this next slide in the middle, I think about this mind, this brain, this propaganda machine that uses toys, the visual, the visual images and imagery, dolls, toys, postcards, children's books, magazines, comics, video games, that expose people to these kinds of stereotypes and social representations of the black female. Consider these brains, this hostile imagination, this weapon of mass dissemination that builds this operation that creates, controls, and disseminates sexist and racist mediated visual imagery and text that can create fear, hatred, loathing, and hostility of others. This next detail, so you think about it again, this imagination had to weave such a web of lies. And here's this machinery, and this is Judy Chicago's work, and if I use the black feminist lens, this imagery, they're weaving these lies, these people are demonized. This black woman is demonized. It's a propaganda machine. It's a weapon of not only mass dissemination, but a weapon of mass deception. So with that said, I like to um, think about some of the things that happens with stereotyping. It leads to scapegoating. That leads to discrimination. That leads to segregation. Leads to physical abuse. That leads to state-sponsored genocide. And this is lessons learned from the Holocaust, not only the Holocaust, but the genocide of African Americans and lynchings of African American people. So when we move forward and think about how the black woman has been demonized, dehumanized, among other areas, Judy Chicago's Birth Earth is very um, an interesting piece to me when I look at it from um, the perspective, when we say using our own perspectives and making connections. How many in here are mothers? I would say at least half of the people raised their hands. So as mothers, we recognize the distress that it may cause to give birth. It's not an easy process. It's a difficult process. But we give, we are the creators of life. So even though we deal with patriarchy on a daily basis or patriarchs, we are their mothers. So with that said, <laughs> It's interesting how sometimes we're oppressed by those to whom we've given the most love and distress to get them to that level of oppressing us, among other things. So with that said, um, so who speaks for the, the mother in the earth? And look at how she's emerging from the earth. And you can see maybe she's wailing. And, and you look at um, her teeth um, and, and how she's 
birthing and, and, and she's feeding and nourishing and yet, you know, she's, she's the mother. So I'd like to revision the mother, the black mother. I am the black mother, other, but she is goddess. The black woman is the first mother. Now, what do I mean by that? In 1984, a group of geneticists published a study in the Journal of Nature. The researchers examined the mitochondrial DNA taken from 147 people across all of today's major racial groups. These researchers found that all people alive today fall on one of two branches of the human family tree. You know where I'm headed with this. <laughs> one of these branches consists of only African lineage. The other includes all other groups, including some African lineage. The scientists, the geneticists, concluded that every person on Earth right now can trace his or her lineage back to a single common female ancestor who lived around 200,000 years ago. So given one entire branch of the human lineage is of African origin, and the other, other contains African lineage, the study's authors concluded that Africa, again dubbed the motherland, is the place where this woman lived. The scientists named humanity's common ancestor mitochondrial Eve. So with that said, we consider the black woman, in some instances she's perceived as the other, but she is our mother. Thank you. So, um, my name is Yan Zhu Ling, and I'm going to present Judy Chicago Web Quest, which is um, one of the projects I am teaching in the class Art Education 322 Visual Culture and Educational Technologies. And in that class, we, I teach about how to use um, educational technologies to facilitate learning and teaching in our education. And uh, so, um, what uh, the first thing I want to talk about is what is a web quest. So essentially, it's an inquiry-based online teaching tool, or you can say it's a medium that aims to engage collaborative reading, learning, and art making. So basically, my student will create a website to present their, um, their teaching material and their lesson planning to facilitate a two weeks long art project that will be taught by um, Jennifer Motter, uh, who is uh, in um, Forest Hill Middle School. She's an art teacher. And my students' web quest will be presented and um, be taught by her in her art classes. And in this project, um, I guided my students with the participatory art pedagogy, uh, which I also encourage them to integrate that into their web quest design. And we are also, um, I also want them to develop their web quest idea by translating or expanding one or more of the 14 encounters of the dinner party curriculum project in the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection. So, and I'm going to share um, some of their work. Um, so this project, basically it's a collaborative teaching and um, learning and teaching uh, between uh, Penn State, our class, and the Forest Hill Middle School art classes. So uh, my student, they design the, the website, they design the lesson plan, and we communicate with Jennifer in Forest, uh, Forest Hill Middle School, and then she teaches the classes, and we will, we will see her students work and my students will, uh, they are uh, pre-service teachers, so they will be practicing on grading and evaluating students' work. Um, so um, the participatory art pedagogy is um, one, one of the design concepts um, 
also the creating progress, um, uh, the processes. Um, it's a, I really consider that as an organic process involving um, preparation process and art making through the, this collaboration with, um, with Jennifer. And the guiding questions are, um, which uh, those you can see below are uh, some screenshots from my students' web quest. Um, the guiding questions are, what will your students learn? That's th these are the questions that I ask my students. Are they learning about uh, learning a set of um, attitude? Are they learning about some set of skills? Um, how will you translate or expand um, the, the dinner party, um, the curriculum, dinner party curriculum project into a web quest? How do you integrate that concept or to build on the dinner party curriculum project? And also, uh, because uh, I'm teaching the educational technology in your class, how will you engage your students through the use of web to you know, technologies? And because my students, they, they, essentially they are teaching virtually, they are not teaching uh, physically in the art classes, but they design the whole thing and they uh, lay out every steps and what is needed um, and use those web 2.0 technology like oh, including social media and other uh, presentation, online presentation tool to facilitate and um, uh, to represent, uh, to present their teaching material and to guide their students. And one of um, and this is, uh, will be one of the examples um, that we, um, the first thing we do is to, uh, to guide my student to uh, go through the dinner party curriculum project and to look for inspirations, to look for ideas. And what you are seeing here is uh, the first encounter, which is titled Table Talk. So one group of my student, they develop um, a web quest that is called um, sculpting idea. So they were looking at the first encounter, the type of talk, and to um, to understand with the, their understanding of using those symbolic object and how to, and also use that uh, the dinner party curriculum project to guide their student to provide resources and to help them to use those. Um, found object to create their sculpture. And the process, uh, what you're seeing here is my course website. So here I provide resources, tools, and for them to uh, develop their web quest. And with that, there are, um, because we, we need to uh, facilitate the process and provide tools for Jennifer to use. So what I do is on their web quest, um, it's from another um, web quest, which is titled um, Dreamcatcher. And they use uh, an online presentation tool called Prezi. That's, oh, they embed the Prezi presentation on their website to, um, to teach their students how to use Photoshop. Um, oh, so because these are making, um, the are making in this whole project, it's two parts. One part is my student making their web quest to facilitate their teaching. And the other part is um, the art making in the middle school. They will be uh, doing their art making with and through the, the facilitation of the web quest. So this is one of the web quest scoping ideas that is their website and that is um, one of the work from the Forest Hill Middle School. And I really see this uh, as um, um, trying to integrate uh, participatory art pedagogy and to use the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection as the resource and also as um, the teaching um, methodology to facil facilitate the whole project. And thank you.